over the last 25 years, I've had the privilege of interviewing and highlighting some truly interesting people. Everyone who is anyone, both the famous and the infamous, from presidents and their first ladies to kings and queens, movie stars and pop stars, captains of industry, heads of state, sports personalities, innovative entrepreneurs, and some pretty fascinating everyday people. Today, I am happy to introduce you to Dr. Thomas Bowles, a leading authority in science and technology whose focus is using science to the advantage of others by improving the lives of people through technology. Dr. Bowles, what would you say is your primary focus as a fellow with the Los Alamos National Laboratory? Yeah. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction, Star. Appreciate that. Um, the fellows are scientific staff members at Los Alamos um, who are ranked as being the top 2% uh, of their profession. They're elected by the laboratory to serve. And we provide advice to the director of the laboratory. Um, sometimes it's just informal in meetings with him um, when he's got some questions. Sometimes it's very formal when he asks us for advice about the longer term future of the laboratory or about some specific program. Um, you know, so, so overall, I would say our, our role as fellows or our responsibility is to ensure the scientific health and technology vi uh, vitality of the laboratory. So I think what we will engage in today is a bit of a master class in science and technology from someone who gets to advise those who are the masters of science and technology. Um, I understand you've contributed to science's understanding of so-called dark matter. Let's start our master class right now. Tell me a little bit more about this. Okay. Um, do you have a week? <laughs> There's a lot to tell you about it. I know. Let's see if you can fill it down to make it a little user friendly for myself yeah. and our viewers. So, so, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to the public uh, about things. Dark matter, everybody seems to have heard about dark matter and dark energy and going, well, what the heck is this? Well, it turns out we know very little about our universe. All of, you know, the stuff around us, the, you know, the books behind you, your desk, the air, water, everything, all of that comprise 5% of the universe. The other 95%, we don't know what it is. We call it we call 75, 70% uh, uh, of it dark matter uh, and 25% of it dark energy. So dark matter is called dark because it's matter just like the matter around us. So it interacts by gravity, but it doesn't emit light. So you can't see it. Dark energy is something even stranger. Uh, it's some form of energy that causes the universe to accelerate in its expansion uh, over time. So I got interested um, in this when I was uh, working on my PhD at Princeton University, and there were two professors there, um, Jerry Garvey, my thesis advisor, and Hamish Robertson, who got me interested in particles called neutrinos. And that's relevant because people had suggested maybe neutrinos are a form of dark matter. So neutrinos are called ghost particles because they sort of don't exist. They don't exist in the, in the sense that they just pass through the earth like it's, um, like it's glass. They, they don't really interact with things. They're, they're very, very weakly interacting. So they're very hard to detect for a long time. Physicists thought we'd never be able to detect them, but turns out as technology advanced, we came up with, with the ways to do that. And so I got interested in this in the neutrinos that come from the sun. So neutrinos were created in the Big Bang explosion that created the universe. They're also um, produced in the fusion reactions in the center of the sun. So to study them, we do something that sounds very strange. We build observatories a mile underground to look into the center of the sun. The reason we do that is that there are these particles called cosmic rays coming in from outer space. They obscure the signal from the neutrinos because the neutrinos are so weak. So I got involved in this at Los Alamos. Um, <clears throat> I led the US effort um, with Russia. It was a joint president to president uh, agreement on joint research. This was back in 1987, long before <laughs> the, the current issues uh, in, in working with Russia. And we worked on a program called the um, Soviet-American gallium experiment. 
the, the, the Russians had an underground laboratory, which we needed. They also had about $50 million worth of gallium metal, which we needed. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have the, um, the computers and the high-tech equipment they needed. So it was a nice collaboration. So I spent a couple of months a year for 12 years in Russia working in this underground lab. And if, if you're ever interested over a beer, I can tell you all kinds of stories of watching the Soviet Union collapse from inside Russia. Wow. But on the science side, we were able to detect these neutrinos from the sun. And we were the first experiment to definitively prove neutrinos have some amount of mass. It's very small. We didn't know how small it was, but we showed that, that, uh, that neutrinos are a form of dark matter. So as a follow-up, I got involved in an experiment um, in Canada um, called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. Uh, it was in a working nickel mine, um, 6,900 feet underground. Um, the Canadians had um, a, a thousand tons of heavy water that they use in their nuclear reactors. That was worth $300 million. They loaned it to us. We built an, a, a detector 11 stories tall, deep, deep underground. 10,000 photomultipliers around the outside looking at the flashes of light that the neutrinos created. And we were able to measure not only see the neutrinos from the sun, but measure their mass. The, the, that result was so important that the experiment won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2015. So now we know 5% of the universe is regular matter, 5% is neutrinos. Still, we don't know the rest of it. And that's the Canadian experiment that you were talking about. That's the Canadian experiment. Yes. Uh -huh. I got it. Now, how did you go from searching for dark matter to growing a clean energy economy? Because that is a front burner issue for so many of us. Right. So, so I made the transition from very fundamental basic research that maybe doesn't affect everybody's everyday lives to areas in high technology that do. Um, and the way I got there was a little circuitous. Uh, I got pulled into management at the laboratory. I mean, literally pulled in. I went off to a meeting, came back, found out they had made me a group leader. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, I ended up as uh, the chief science officer at the lab and a member of the senior executive uh, team. So I was involved and responsible for all of the science programs at Los Alamos, including technology. We do a lot of technology development. We spin off a lot of things that go into everyday products that people use in their lives. So I, I was involved in uh, technology commercialization and development. Um, the, 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 the laboratory underwent a change in 2005. It changed from a university to a defense contractor. So my position changed. The director of the laboratory asked me to become science advisor for, the, for Governor Bill Richardson. They had always had science advisors. They appreciated the advice. So I went and met with Governor Richardson. He said he was looking for some big, bold ideas. And I thought, that sounds like fun. So, so I agreed to go to become a science advisor. Um, so that got me involved in clean energy because Governor Richardson was a very strong proponent of clean energy. And I worked with him on that. So give me a little bit more about that work as a science advisor for New Mexico's Governor Bill Richardson. I know that this is something that he really and truly embraces. He's looking for bold ideas and people who will push the envelope and not be afraid um, to go where others have not gone. That sounds exactly up your alley, Dr. Boss. It does. And, and, and I have to say, I really enjoy working with him. He's, he's a very interesting guy. Um, so, so when I went there, um, his question to me was, you know, okay, um, what do you think we should be doing in science and technology? Um, so clean energy was at the top. Another was, was supercomputing to help companies uh, design products better and so on. But the super, the, uh, the, the, the work on clean energy sort of took, took a lead in this. Uh, Governor Richardson was friends with the Minister of Economy of Japan. So the Secretary of Economic Development and I went over to Japan. We signed uh, a joint agreement on joint economic development. So I, I met with the Japanese after we signed the agreement. And, and I just said, are you interested in clean energy and the smart grid? Oh, my gosh. We spent five hours then talking about that. They got involved with us. They had companies coming over, a dozen companies working with us. 
they invested $75 million, uh, one in, in a, a one megawatt solar array up here in Los Alamos and smart grid, another one down in Albuquerque. So they were putting their money where their mouth was. Our interest for New Mexico was get them involved in this. And just like Kentucky got Toyota to come and start building cars in Kentucky, we wanted the Japanese companies to start coming and building all these components for clean energy and smart grid here in New Mexico, create jobs. Um, so we were on, on our road to that um, when, when we changed administrations and the new administration had a little different slant on it. But, but for me, it got me interested in uh, this clean energy and a clean energy economy. And so I have to thank the governor for his, his advice and, and support and, and having me included in all the cabinet meetings and everything else and being able to make these connections. It was great. Dr. Bowles, what do you actually view is science's role in helping to grow a clean energy economy? Well, you know, science and technology underpins the development of everything you can think of. I mean, cell phones, you know, high definition television, computing systems, you name it, it comes about because of advances in science and technology. Um, and, and so just in the same way, you know, we're now switching to systems where we have electric vehicles being charged up at your home, people have solar panels on the roof and so on. That came out of, uh, out of scientific developments uh, creating solar cells. Those were created at the national laboratories first. So a big part of growing the economy uh, is this technology-based economic development. And it's about creating permanent jobs. So it's great to install solar panels and wind farms, but the people come in, they do it, the job is done, they go home. What we wanted to do was create jobs that use that clean energy and a, a great example is Facebook. Facebook wanted to use 100% clean energy. New Mexico has the lowest cost of renewable energy in the United States. So they decided to come here and build a data center. They spent a billion dollars doing that. They liked it so much, now they're spending another $6 billion to extend it. And so we're creating permanent jobs around this clean energy. And that's what the clean energy economy is. That makes complete sense. It's sort of the old adage the African proverb, if you uh, give a man a fish, he eats for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, then he can feed his family and help feed his community and help grow his community. A lot more complicated, but it's the same principle. It is, exactly. So you told me some of the things that New Mexico is doing that is very positive. Tell me some of the biggest problems facing New Mexico today and give me, um, again, my master yep. class request. How would you propose to solve those problems? <laughs> yeah, like I have all the solutions to the no, world. No, you don't have all the solutions, but you got some solutions <laughs> and you have some pretty good <laughs> ideas. So, so I thought about this a while after you asked, sent me that question. Um, th there's really two issues that, that we face here in New Mexico. One is environmental and the other is societal. And, and that's typical, I think, of everywhere in the United States. You know, it's We've had a 20 year drought here in New Mexico. Um, people don't really understand what that means and what the impact of climate change has meant to us. I've had to evacuate my house twice because of forest fires caused by the drought. Um, and people don't understand the intensity of these things. You know, we've had fires here that have burned several hundred square miles of forest. You look around in the forest that's left, the trees are all dying, they're dead everywhere. You look at the Rio Grande River, the, you know, the Spanish conquistador Coronado 400 years ago called it the Rio Grande, the Great River, because it was so big. Now it dries up before it even gets out of New Mexico. The intensity of these fires, I had friends who lost their homes, lost their cars. You would drive up around there. The heat was so intense, cars would catch fire, their engine blocks would melt, and the molten metal would run down across the street and freeze. I mean... Who could believe that? So, you know, we need to, uh, to address that. We need to address moving away from fossil fuels. That's really hard because it's really entrenched in our lives. I mean, I think most people think about gas, you know, and oil, but all the plastics that we have and use come from fossil fuels, you know? So it's embedded in every day of our life. The companies are making a lot of money. They don't want to change, but, you know, if they don't change, the world that we leave to our children 
is going to become increasingly hostile and difficult to survive in. So mm -hmm. you have to change if you want to survive. It's just that simple. People need to realize that. So, so the, the clean energy economy is, is a way to do that. Replace the, clean, the, the fossil fuel jobs with clean energy jobs that are high paying, high wage, and sustainable. So that's my part of my solution to, to, to the question of, of the environment. The other part is probably even harder to solve, um, societal problems. You know, everybody remembers what 180 years ago now, President Lincoln said, government is for the people, by the people, and of the people. Well, guess what? That's no longer true. <laughs> We're, we live in a very polarized world. You see every day on the news that Congress can't agree about anything. They're not looking for a common good. They're looking to perpetuate themselves. And that's true of businesses and people. Everything evolves around making money. The rich get richer. Everybody hears that. The poor get poorer. But I mean, New Mexico, we're seeing that. And like most other states in the country, the number of people living in poverty is increasing. So the way to combat that is you got to create more well-paying jobs. So the, the clean energy economy is a way to do that. My nonprofit, NAMI, which is um, the North American Intelligent Manufacturing Initiative, we just got funded by the U.S. government to do a three-year study of, so how do you actually create a clean energy economy? What are the steps? What are the priorities? We've laid it out. It's on our website at worldwideweb.nami.us. And we have that displayed look right at now, it. just so you know. Yes, indeed. Okay, great. So, you know, the thing that we found in that is you have to take a holistic approach to this. It involves local government, state government, federal government, businesses, our universities, our education system. Everybody has to get involved in this. It's not simple or easy, but, you know, if we want to make the world a better place when we leave it than when we entered it, we've got to switch over and drive change towards common good. And we also have to work together. What you've emphasized is a collaboration is absolutely imperative for moving the needle forward. Yep, yep. So that's you know part of the solution I, I think is creating this clean energy economy. There's a lot more that needs to be done, but this is a definitive, a definite step we can make that's laid out specifics, what you need to do, who needs to do it, what has to be done first and so on. Well, you you laid out some of the problems that are facing New Mexico today. I would venture to say they're universal problems. Um, yep. but I'm gonna give you another one. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think we can solve the problem of making sure that educational standards are kept up to the point that the workforce is actually equipped to use more and more sophisticated technology because you know, every family that I talk to, they emphasize education is the key to success in our family. Education is the key to success. We all seem to agree with that across the board, but how we are educated and what we are educated in is absolutely imperative for our future. I'd love to have your thoughts on that, sir. Well, thank you, because I, I believe that that's got to be the foundation of everything that we do. I mean, science and technology comes about through education, through educating students, but also educating the public. And I'm sure you're familiar with Neil deGrasse Tyson, the director of the New York Planetarium. He's been on all kinds of talk shows and so on. He's a very intelligent guy with a lot of very important and, and accurate statements. So one of the things he said in a recent interview was, we don't teach science in the US. You know, in school, we basically teach kids facts that we want them to memorize and pass the test. It's about passing a test. It's not about really how does education teach science. So when, when I was science advisor at Governor Richardson, you know, I met with all kinds of people from business, private citizens, universities, charities, et cetera. And you know, the, the range of questions that you would get from them just made me realize people don't understand science at all. Um, I would meet with people and they would want me to get the governor to do something. So for example, one woman came to me and said, we talked for a while and finally I said, well, if, if I understand right, you want me to get Governor Richardson to shut off all the electricity in the city of Santa Fe, is that right? Yes, because that would eliminate her headaches if we did that. Well, I told the governor, you know, well, guess what? He didn't shut off all the electricity. <laughs> 
But, you know, time after time, I would meet with people. They'd tell me about a problem. And I'd say, well, okay, you know, the scientific theory on this is X, Y, Z. And their response would be, that's fine. That's your theory. Mine is J, K, Y, you know. And my theory is just as good as your theory. Well, you know, I'm sorry. That's simply not true. Science validates physical interactions. We study them and we write those down in the form of laws of nature. And as Neil uh, deGrasse Tyson says, you know, the good thing about science is it's true whether or not you believe in it. So how can we change the educational program? I mean, I see that as the problem. So I'm working uh, with a group called the Supercomputing Challenge. Um, we work to form teams of students in mid school and high school who define a science project. They then get a teacher to help them on it. They work with it throughout the year. And at the end, the students present their, their, uh, their projects. The judges rank them, we give out various uh, awards. But you know, the, the things that some of these students do, I have to tell you one story. So a few years ago, team a young woman and young man here in New Mexico, they decided their science project was how to improve the health of kids in sub-Saharan Africa. Wow. So they worked on this. They contacted charities, non-government organizations in South Africa and got the information on what they were feeding kids, how they were doing it. And they wrote 14,000 lines of computer code. And the goal was take all the input about the nutritional value of all the different kinds of foods in Africa, what's needed to provide the nutritional value to the students, where do you get it? How far do you have to transport it? How do you package it? How do you distribute it? What are the costs of all these things? Their conclusion was they could provide the recommended nutrition for 2 million kids in sub-Saharan Africa at 20% less cost than currently is, is, is costing. So then they wrote this up in a user-friendly code and they sent it out to all these organizations they can use on their laptops in Africa to look at the different foods and so on. It'll tell them, how do we put together the packages for these kids? So, you know, high school students affecting the health of 2 million kids wow. in sub-Saharan Africa through science. Wow. So I think that's, that sort of is a good model. We need to teach kids how science works, not just facts. So teach courses in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Teach them how it works. And so I've started an effort with the New Mexico Public Education Department to see if we can incorporate some of this into the, into the classes in, in school. And maybe this could be a model for the country. If you teach kids science, they'll understand things better when they grow up and have a better way of making decisions. So I was very serious when I said I was going to get a master class a little bit today. Uh, Dr. Bowles, thank you so very much. What, what's the one thing you'd like the viewer of this video feature to walk away with before we go, sir? I think people need to get more engaged in understanding the issues that impact every moment of their lives, whether it's, it's energy, whether it's jobs, um, you know, anything, sports, you name it. Um, right now, our society is so dependent on technology. And, you know, I mean, here we are using technology that 30 years ago, nobody would have dreamed of, you know, that you and I could be talking to each other 2000 miles apart like this, you know. Um, so we're very dependent on technology, but we're also amazingly ignorant about science and technology. People don't understand it. There's lots of misinformation and hype out there. Um, that's really harming us, I think. If people could just look at an issue, you know, pragmatically with an open mind and include, you know, vital information, valid information in making their decision, then you could make the right decisions. And I think this requires you to understand and support STEM. Um, we, we need to move to this sustainable clean energy future and high wage jobs. And the way to do that is through science and technology. We need to start supporting STEM in the schools, but it has to go beyond that. If it was just students learning about it, it's not enough. We need to provide ways to provide people through the press, through, through newspapers, things they hear, courses, lots of different ways, get good information out to people so that they can make good decisions. 
you know, you can't make good decisions if you don't have the right information. So let's get people the right information. You know, we can, we, we can all be, and I believe we have to be a part of ensuring we get good information so that we can make the right decisions that lead all of us to a sustainable and brighter future. Dr. Bowles, uh, you have laid out um, a game plan that would absolutely uh, be beneficial for every community um, to look at, to review, and to incorporate um, into their own individual communities. Um, you said that it starts with getting the right information out. Let's just say, I think we've done that today. Thank you so very much, sir. I appreciate well, your Thank time. you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.